guess I should start. Hi, this is David Torsivia. And this is Daniel Forkner. And we are here with Ashes, Ashes, a podcast about the collapse of the world and our society at large. And I just want to start off by saying that neither of us are even remotely qualified to talk about any of these subjects. I'm certainly not qualified. And here we are anyway, talking on a podcast, which I, by the way, absolutely hate. But uh, it's the format to be on I hear these days, and uh, no one's reading my newsletters. So here I am coming directly into your ears. I think podcast is going to be a good format for this. The newsletter is good, but this is going to bring it down to a, a more relatable level. Yeah, and that's really the goal of the podcast as a whole. I mean, we hear a lot of things in the news about like, oh, this is so terrible, the politics, the the economy, climate change, all this bad stuff happening uh, this year, especially was marked by natural disasters, the hurricanes, the wildfires out west, um, and lots of problems all around the world. And we hear all this talk about like, oh, you know, things are bad, things are bad. But at the same time, on the other hand, we hear this discussion of how we live in the greatest time of humanity, that, you know, there's less poor, poverty is lower than it ever has been. Our life expectancies are high, people are happier, people are wealthier. And um, there's a disconnect sort of between what people see in the world and see around them and what they feel personally um, is going on. So we're going to explore some of that. We're going to explore uh, what's actually going on, um, what the future really holds, despite some of the rosy predictions of the media and uh, our politicians and business leaders, and uh, see how all these different elements, um, natural climate change, business, politics, the things going on around the world are all really interconnected and brought together through um, the various strands that connect each and every one of us. We're going to talk about specific events in the world. We're going to be talking about things going on all around us all the time. And uh, we're really going to explore how all of this connects and the things that we can do about it and things that we can't do about it and what that means for our future. We're both really excited to talk about this stuff. And we're going to jump into a very big topic today, nothing in particular news-wise to do with this, but something that really has huge impacts on both our future and the world as a whole. So, uh, Daniel, why don't you take us in? All right. I'm really excited, too. Today, we're going to be talking about the Arctic Ocean and some of the things going on there that you might be wanting to be aware of. Where do you think we should start, David, in the Arctic well, let's talk about what the Arctic is exactly, right? So, I mean, we have two poles on the, the world. We have the Arctic, we have the Antarctic. Um, and we're going to be paying most of our attention to the Arctic because it's, uh, it's where most of the climate science and interest lies. And that's because the Arctic is um, mostly an ocean. It's an ocean and it has ice most of the year, not the entire year, versus Antarctica, which is a solid land mass with ice on it. Well, what happens over the Antarctic is very important. The effects on that landmass is much less dramatic for the rest of the world than what's going on in the Arctic. And the big reason why that's the case is because of the ocean. The Arctic Ocean, which acts as the top connector between the oceans and the, the east and the west, is really important in the way that heat is dispensed around the world. Yeah, that was one thing that really interested me or surprised me when I was reading up about some of this is, is how these oceans are so interconnected, how some of the icebergs that are in the Arctic are actually influenced by the heat in different layers of the ocean that are coming from different parts of the world. I didn't really quite understand it, though, to be honest. Maybe you can explain how the warmer water in the bottom of the ocean comes up into the Arctic. Yeah, and that's a really excellent point, Daniel. And the big driver of this is something called the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, which is a word I'm never going to say again, so we'll just call it the AMOC for short. And if you've ever seen that movie, that disaster movie, Day After Tomorrow, you you know, when the, like, the uh, Atlantic current, like, shuts down and then the world, like, freezes and the guy has to hide in, like, a freezer in, like, a fast food restaurant or else he'll freeze to death as soon as the shadow touches him. Remember yeah, I, I remember that one. I think wolves were a big risk in that movie. Yeah, those, those digital wolves. The, I mean, the only real risk for all of us is, is having to sit through that. But uh, that movie was more or less about this ocean current slowing and ultimately shutting down and throwing the, the heat exchange of this ocean all out of whack. And as ridiculous and silly as that movie is, it is based on scientific ideas. And this actually is a concern from climate scientists and uh, from other people that we might actually be coming into a sort of day after tomorrow scenario, if not that extreme. But this is important because it carries the heat from the mid-latitudes, from the Caribbean, all those things that spread up all those hurricanes and, and cause such a bad hurricane season this year, and carries that heat and basically in a highway expressway um, along the ocean 
up to the northern latitudes where it sinks down when it hits the cold water and it mixes up and it upwells and goes down and it causes this big churning process that sort of mixes all the ocean the water in the ocean and really drives the currents that pushes our weather and the ocean currents themselves. It's a hugely important cycle and has a lot to do with the weather all around the world. And there's a couple of things that might cause concern for this AMOP. One of them is all the glaciers melting in Greenland. All this cold, fresh water melts on the land, goes into the ocean, and displaces all this warm, salty water from the mid-latitudes. And it slows this current down. It slows this process. That's, that's a conversation for another time. But the same thing is happening in the Arctic with this changing patterns as more ice is melting um, and less ice is, is being formed in the first place. Um, and that's a conversation we'll have in just a moment. So you mentioned how the Arctic and the ocean water that swirls there, the different temperatures can have effects on weather patterns around the world. Um, Recently, we've had a big wildfire in California, and I've read some reports that link things like wildfires on the West Coast with some of these changing patterns in the Arctic. Is that true? I mean, how, how linked are these two things? Yeah, okay. So the Arctic itself is a sort of a place where all this excess energy of the Earth moves up to and then gets dissipated because it's so much colder. Um, it, it brings all this excess power and stuff and cools it down and lets us uh, have a more stable climate. And as the Arctic warms up, and it warms up much faster than the rest of the world because all this heat is carried up there, sort of like a battery, this, this process of heating faster than the rest of the world is called Arctic amplification. And this amplification has huge effects on the weather around the world. The wildfires you mentioned are caused by this sort of meandering that's appeared in the past few years of the jet stream. And everybody knows the jet stream because uh, it's, it's got the coolest name of any weather phenomenon. And you can really feel it. You know, when you're flying across the country and you go one way and it's shorter than the other, it's because you have those favorable winds of the jet stream. And the jet stream really has a huge effect on the weather all around the world. Right now in the west, uh, western part of the United States, This jet stream has been bringing in warm, dry air, and uh, that has been a huge contribution to the wildfires that are occurring out there. At the same time, we saw the meandering of the jet stream cause these big stalls and ridges. That was the reason that Hurricane Harvey just stalled out over Houston, and instead of moving up through the uh, rest of the country and dissipating like hurricanes and tropical storms normally do, instead got trapped by this meandering jet stream and just sat there dumping all the water on the city for days and days and days and causing that unprecedented damage, which last I saw was on that storm alone was estimated over $200 billion, which makes it the second most expensive natural disaster in human history, followed only by the 2011 earthquake and tsunamis in Japan. Yeah, it was pretty bad. I went out to Houston a a week or two afterwards and My aunt was driving me around and showing me some of the just entire highways that had been overrun by water. A lot of businesses completely shut down. A lot of of houses flooded, bad stuff. Yeah, and it's a huge tragedy. And while we like to blame it on these hotter waters in the Caribbean and in the Mid-Atlantic, which is definitely part of the equation, uh, what caused and made that storm itself so damaging is actually the Arctic. So we usually think of the Arctic as this thing that's far away and like, yeah, the melting ice is bad and I guess it's bad for polar bears or the Antarctic is bad for penguins. But that's that's where we this equation ends. We don't realize how much these changes affect the rest of the world. And we haven't even gotten into the really, really bad stuff yet. We talk about how these changes impact our day-to-day, but are we responsible for them? How much do we play a role in them? And is there anything we can do about it? I mean, what should we be aware of in terms of how we are playing a role in this? Well, sure. I mean, that's a really broad question and something that, that we could spend a lot of time on. But in short, yes, we are hugely responsible for this. We're not going to sit here and pretend that there's a natural component to global warming and, and humans may or may not contribute to it, like the politically safe talking points to it. Uh, This is something that is almost entirely anthropologically caused, put out just a huge amount of greenhouse gases. Humankind has absolutely been the primary and by a lot driver of this change. And while there are natural systems um, influencing this and there are natural feedback systems that have suddenly started kicking in because of our contributions to get us past these trigger points, the vast majority of it up until very recently has been human activity. Um, And that's only recently been met by uh, natural contributions from things like melting permafrost and melting uh, methane deposits beneath the Arctic, which is something we'll get to shortly. And so, yes, we're the ones ruining the world and destroying the Arctic. 
But why does that matter, right? All this ice and stuff. I see a lot of people, um, well, a lot of politics that talk about the Arctic. Oh, yeah, it's a good thing. It's the Arctic melts. You know, we can use this fabled Northwest Passage, which isn't a fable anymore. It's something you can actively do. And there are reports on the ship that made the first, you know, pass each year. It's a, it's a much faster way to, to ship around than, than going all the way down to Panama Canal or, or paying even farther south. So it's exciting for commerce. There's a lot of speculation that there are oil and gas deposits that could be mined and used to even further our <laughs> contributions to the CO2. And uh, as well as other rare earth elements and things on the bottom of the ocean, there's a, there's a cold war almost of uh, geologists from Russia and the United States trying to figure out who gets dibs on who, and the Canadians too, and also the, the Danes with their claim from Greenland. It's a lot of people trying to get into the Arctic. I think I also read a report, though, that as attractive as it is, it's actually more difficult to access some of the resources in the Arctic than previously thought. And some of the people trying to use, you know, like the Northern Passage for trade routes are finding it to be a little bit more difficult and too costly. There's a lot of icebergs floating around, so you got to spend a lot more on reinforcing ship holes and things like that. Yeah, right now it's not economically viable for almost everything. But, and I say this with a hint of irony, the hope from these people is is that this melting process will continue and there'll be, you know, longer and longer periods with no or little ice to enable these economic activities to occur. But of course, the economic impacts from a warming Arctic vastly, vastly outweigh whatever positive benefits we get from it. And so let's talk about why and why less ice is just so terrible for the world and our climate. Every time I've, you know, in the past, I've heard reports of ice caps melting, icebergs melting. I always connected that risk with the fact that it rises the sea level. And, you know, I always had pictures like, oh, you know, any city that's on the coast might have to move in a little bit. Obviously, it might be inconvenient for beachfront property when the sea waters rise. But there's a lot more to it than that, I think. Well, yeah. And actually, a lot of this is sea ice, which means it's already on the ocean. And so that doesn't actually affect any sort of uh, sea level rise. Think about it like if you have a glass of water and it has an ice cube in it. As that ice cube melts, it doesn't overflow your glass because the displacement and everything is already there. And the concern with rising sea levels is ice that's already on land. So things like Greenland, which is covered um, in extremely thick ice that melts and then drains into the ocean and causes uh, sea level rise from that. But the big concern with sea ice is that it's a uh, it's basically a big reflector. So I'm from the south, and it gets really hot in the summer. And I drove a black car, which was a mistake. You leave that out in the sun, and it's basically a little oven. And uh, I would try and fight that. I had you know one of those like shiny screens that you put in your window, like in the hood. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you are actually one of the few people. Actually, one of the only people I've known that actually used that reflector in their windshield. Yeah, I mean, I was I was really anal about it because my car would get so hot. Um, and the, my hope is, you know, putting this little thing up is going to reflect some of that sun back into the, the atmosphere or whatever and just keep it out of the inside of my car. And it did work. It made a difference. I mean, my car was still roasting, but it, it made a difference. Maybe not as much as driving a white car would have. So you're saying the whole earth is losing its windshield reflector. Yeah, I mean, that's a really uh, simple way of putting it. But yeah, so think about it this way. Ocean, ocean water, you know, it's it's dark blue. It's black. It, it, it absorbs a lot of heat because that's what water does. Um, whereas ice is uh, white or light light blue and, and reflective. So all this, this sunlight that's coming in, especially in the summer, you know, where these they have all these 24-hour days, and there's constantly light beating down. And, and obviously, I mean, the light isn't as intense up here as it is along the tropics, but it still, you know, adds up, and it adds a lot of energy into the system. And when you have lots of ice there, most of the energy is reflected back up into the sky um, and out into space. But once that ice is gone, it's absorbed into the ocean itself. And this is the start of a big feedback loop. As that ocean absorbs this heat and warms up, it becomes harder to freeze ice. And when it becomes harder to freeze ice, that means the freezing season comes in, you know, a few days or a few weeks later, and then it happens slower. And then uh, when it becomes time for melt, there's less ice there, and the ice that is there is thinner and not as healthy as as old sea ice should be. And then that means a little bit more ice melts that year. And this keeps happening, and each year a little bit more ice melts, and there's there's seasonal variations because some years are cooler, some years are warmer, um, some years have more cloud cover, some years are sunny the whole time. And there's a lot of other things that, that impact this 
even the age of the ice too, I found that really interesting is that the ice that's older is less, you know, more reflective because the water that does melt gets caught in these jagged spaces. Whereas the newer ice that forms, it's a lot smoother and the water that melts on top of that gets spread out more evenly, which you know, reduces the reflectivity more. Yeah, and that forms these things called melt pools, which which themselves are dark and contributes more to the direct melting of the ice from both the top and the bottom. Fun facts about ice. Fun facts about ice. And so a lot of this research right now is focused on different types of cover and, and how snow or rain impacts this. Snow early in the season, in the, in the freezing season, um, is terrible for, for developing ice because it, it acts as an insulation and makes it harder for more ice to develop. Whereas snow late in the free season and the beginning of the melt season acts the, in the opposite way. And it prevents ice melt and as, a, as a blanket of the ice to insulate it from the rays of the sun. And so these, these little seasonal fluctuations and variations are very important in part of this equation. But in general, the trend has been more energy in the system, more heat in the Arctic, less ice. And you can see this every year, and it's been going on for decades, um, and it's been getting worse all the time. 2016 was one of the worst freezing seasons we've had in a long time. They were fortunate, and we had a, a cool, fairly cool summer, so the melt wasn't so bad. But the ice that is there is very sick. Um, it's mostly new ice. It's broken up. There's very little multi-year ice left. The ice that's there is much thinner and weaker um, to the point where it's actually impacting research. Positions where they used to be able to stand and, and do a lot of research and place beacons and things. Now we're just, the ice is literally rotten. It's filled with holes and cracks and it's not safe to stand on. And this is happening both in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. I think I read just recently that, um, uh, what was it, Daniel? They had to abandon a uh, research station down there. Yeah, one of the cracks that is forming, I think, threatened one of their s supply lines. And they also wanted to move more inland because one of the cracks threatens a calving, I think, of the ice sheet. So this is impacting it, the ice itself, as well as our ability to research the ice and get good data on it in order to better understand exactly what is happening and uh, what the future might hold. So this, this heat that's coming into the system from this loss of albedo isn't the only part of the, the heat equation. Uh, all this extra water that's being pumped into the system is having other effects too. Some of it becomes water vapor, um, which we always like to point out, you know, CO2, CO2, that's that's the big greenhouse gas, but just as important as water vapor. It has a huge, huge greenhouse effect as well as uh, contributing more energy into the system and trapping that and causing uh, huge dramatic swings in weather. Um, we've had these... these uh, big pop-up record rainstorms for the past couple of years. And that's because there's a lot more moisture just in the atmosphere in general. Some people are calling these rain bombs. But it, it, a lot of it has to do with the fact that there's just more water in the system. And this melting ice is a big contributor to that. And it's especially bad in the Arctic because as this ice melts and as less ice freezes, it forms almost a, a blanket of uh, water vapor over itself and over the Arctic as a whole, which acts as a blanket trapping in more heat. On the flip side, though, um, this also is causing more clouds, and we're having cooler, cloudier summers from this. So hopefully that continues and we get a little bit of respite from this from this uh, feedback loop that's, that's causing a little bit of slowed cooling, um, despite the fact that uh, we are pumping more and more energy into the system all the time. Earlier, you mentioned when we started talking about the Arctic that it's a huge uh, contributor to some of the problems around the climate. What, why is the Arctic so important? I mean, what sets it apart from some of the other climate issues that we're hearing about? I mean, that's a really good question. So uh, we've talked a little bit about the wandering of the jet stream, which causes huge effects both local and uh, around the world. It's in, impacting storms all the way in, you know, in, the, in the tropics, these hurricanes, things that we wouldn't think are inf influenced by the Arctic at all. And it, it can cause, uh, if you remember a few years ago, that, uh, that polar vo vortex uh, phenomenon where we had these extreme dips of Arctic air coming down south into the country. The Northeast had a lot of it, but it was dipping down as far south into Georgia and, and Florida, you know, really impacting, you know, heating homes as well as, as crops and, and things like that. Um, and these are caused by the fact that the jet stream is much weaker and, and, and the Arctic oscillations are much more sporadic, uh, much more unpredictable and behaving far more wildly than we've ever seen before. So and we see more and more extremes. It's causing records, both highs and lows. And that's because there's just more energy being pumped into the system itself. And so the big scare is that as this ice continues to melt, we're going to get to this thing called the blue ocean event, which is depending on who you ask, you know, less than 10% of ice left during these summer melt months. 
And that's when things are really going to get cooking because all this uh, water is going to be exposed to the sun. And uh, we're going to be seeing a huge amount of energy pumped in this system that wasn't before. And remember, the poles are about dissipating all the excess heat and excess energy that comes out from the tropics where the sun is beating down intensely all year. And this heat spirals up and gets up to the north and the south, and it dissipates there um, where there's less energy and it's frozen or it's buried into the ocean and, and it disappears and we don't have to worry about it. And, but this battery has been charging um, and it's been filling up with heat, and the ocean depths are warming, and the ocean as a whole are warming because of this. Um, and it threatens both uh, some of these these huge currents that we depend on for our, our climate. And this isn't a question of like, oh, yeah, you know, the weather's going to change, or like, uh, it could cause big storms, but like dramatic climate shifts. And not, not we're not talking about climate change or climate warming. We're talking about like this area which depends on warmth from the tropics brought up uh, through these these ocean currents to it to very high latitudes like uh, like most of Western Europe is very high latitudes compared to what we have in the United States, but it is warmed primarily through you know this Atlantic current carrying it all up, and as this current slows and weakens because of actions in the Arctic and through melting ice in Greenland, uh, that climate may shift and we may see things cool down. Um, though the latest predictions I saw have more super hot, super dry summer and heat waves like, um, what do they call that? The devil heat wave. But this is huge potential for affecting crops and, and uh, agriculture and ways of living that we just may not be prepared for as society or culture. But you say we might not be prepared for it, but it seems like there's a lot of efforts globally to curb carbon emissions to help mitigate the consequences of climate change. We've got, you know, the Paris Agreement, which obviously the United States um, has some controversy around our participation in that. But a lot of people are coming together. A lot of countries are coming together. A lot of companies are coming together. They're marketing saying, we care about climate change. We're focused on addressing the problems and mitigating the consequences. Surely, you know, we are preparing in some way for some of these changes. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and that sounds great. And everybody's like taking out their pom poms and cheering us on. And even though the United States has chosen not to participate in the Paris Agreement, we see these like mayors and, and governors and states saying like, well, the United States may not, but California is. And, um, and everyone is like patting themselves on the back and feeling good about like, oh, yeah, we converted 100% to renewable energy by the year 2050. And all everyone is feeling amazing and cutting ribbons and, and doing all this change. But fact of the matter is, is that Paris Agreement, first, is non-binding, even for the states that decided to participate in it. Second, it's built on uh, very conservative science, um, ex- overly conservative, a lot of cli- climate scientists would say. Third, they left out some major feedback loops, um, some of it intentionally, some of it because they lacked enough data to, to model it accurately and that they wanted to err on the side of caution. And, you know, some of it because uh, if their numbers were too high and people realize you can't do anything, then, you know, who's going to want to completely destroy their economy in order to have a chance of surviving? So it's easier for everyone to sort of cover their ears and scream at the top of their lungs that everything is okay. And that's really what the Paris Climate Agreement is. And even the countries that have agreed to it are missing their targets by a dramatic amount. I just saw a report from the UN that we're at basically a third of where we need to be in terms of pledges um, in order to meet the two Celsius goal. And uh, even with those pledges, a lot of countries are overshooting it. Uh, I just saw Germany is going to dramatically overshoot its pledge, and they're considered one of the world leaders in renewable energy. So it's a goal for a number that is artificially too low based on uh, science that is questionable with countries that are just pretending to do something about it. We, we are doing a little bit, but imagine you're standing on a train track and there's a train barreling at you and you can see the train and you can hear the train and it's blowing its horn and you know it's coming and you know it's not going to swerve out of the way because it's a train. And you've decided years ago, well, I'm not moving off this train track you know, this is, I have to be on this train track. This is the society. This is the, the course of our society. We can't leave here. So I'm going to build a wall to stop myself from this train and to protect myself. But you've only got, you know, styrofoam pellets. So, so you're sitting there piling up these styrofoam pellets, hoping that this train is going to slow down enough when it hits your two feet of pellets that you're going to be fine. <laughs> Well, I got news for you. So, Your pellets aren't going to stop this train. So when you say we are doing something, you really mean we're 
not doing very much. <laughs> We're doing the bare minimum, and that's not even going to be enough to hit even these two degrees Celsius. I'm let's 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 talk about one of these feedback loops that was modeled, because this is tied very closely into the Arctic and the the areas surrounding the Arctic. So when I say Arctic, it doesn't just mean the ocean. That is the focus of what we're talking about, um, but also you know the tundra and the plains around it. And those tundra and plains are filled with with permafrost, feet and and several meters deep permafrost. And what permafrost is, is is soil and organic matter that is frozen year round. The fact that this is frozen has meant that all this carbon and energy and stuff that's caught in this decaying matter is locked there. It's stored there. So I read somewhere that the permafrost in the Arctic holds something like half of the world's carbon or carbon soil that's locked in plant matter and animal matter. Can that really be true though? I mean, it seems like there'd be a lot more carbon matter, plant material in more vegetated areas, you know, lower latitudes than the Arctic where there's really just what sea life and polar bears. Well, I mean, the Arctic's a lot more than that. So, so there's, there's forests and there's grasslands and peatlands and, and there's animals and uh, there's a lot of land. So, I mean, think of Siberia, how huge that is. Most of that is, you know, this Arctic tundra and Siberian forest. So there's a lot of organic matter there and a lot of permafrost uh, locks it up. And it's just years and years of this stored up organic material. And it's been locked away because it, when it's frozen, it can't be digested by bacteria that normally occur around the world and release this stuff, you know, as methane and as carbon dioxide and release it into the atmosphere. Instead, it just gets locked away in this ice. But as the global temperature warms, and especially as the Arctic warms, which again is the fastest area of warming by a dramatic amount, uh, this permafrost starts to melt. And uh, as it melts, it outputs CO2 and methane, primarily methane. And we, again, you know, CO2 is always, you know, the bad guy that we talk about. Yeah, what's the difference between how carbon and methane interplay in the atmosphere? Well, methane actually degrades into two of our favorite greenhouse gases, uh, carbon dioxide and H2O, water vapor. And this, this degradation happens fairly quickly and then turns into the CO2 and water vapor, which sticks around for a long time. But methane itself is also a very potent greenhouse gas and traps a lot more energy than either carbon dioxide or water vapor. So it's a huge contributor to these other greenhouse gases and then becomes these greenhouse gases as it decays. So it's really got like a one-two punch, just like a fuck you to humanity. And so as this uh, permafrost melts and these uh, bacteria can suddenly digest all this delicious you know, plant material and, and, and biomaterial that's been there for years, it releases huge amounts of methane. And you can actually go online and like look up maps, like methane output maps, uh, because we have satellites that measure this stuff. And you can see the Arctic is just bright red. And you would expect this over like natural gas deposits and, and uh, you know, industrial cities and stuff. And, and you'll see little, you know, like wisps that come from these places, but the Arctic itself is just a bright red. And that's because we are just outgassing methane and carbon dioxide from this decaying and melting permafrost like crazy. And even more, there actually are frozen methane deposits um, on the ocean floors of the Arctic. And in fact, frozen methane deposits in the uh, tundra as well. Maybe you've seen these um, reports of exploding craters in Siberia. Have you seen these? No, I haven't. They're called um, pingus. And they're just... uh, Basically, a whole bunch of methane, like this, this permafrost starts melting, right? And the, the uh, bacteria start eating it up and they're, nom, 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 and they're releasing this CO2 methane, but they're doing it underground because this isn't just the top layer that's happening. This is happening all the way down into the soil, you know, feet or several meters down. Like I said, it just forms pockets down there under the ground. Yeah, exactly. So it releases this methane and it forms these like bubbles. Um, and then all of a sudden there becomes too much and the thing just blows up and you have these huge craters forming all across the Arctic. And I remember a few years ago, the first one was found and they were like, what is this? What could possibly be causing this? And some people suggested methane. And, and at the time researchers were like, no, that's, that's crazy. That's not possible. And then they got out there and they took their measurements and like, yeah, okay. It seems like it's a methane explosion. And now it's not just like there's one, like it's, it's like a, almost like the moon with these huge craters from these methane explosions, just to give you an idea of how much of this is happening and how quick it's happening. And this is something, again, that only appeared a few years ago, but it now is commonplace across the Arctic tundra. And the same thing is happening underwater as well. Is that going to be a major contributor, though? Just the the gas that's released itself into the atmosphere? 
So yeah, I mean, this is a, a major contributor to the total output of these greenhouse gases. Um, and it's something that's just increasing. I don't remember the statistics off the top of my head. I'll have to look it up later. But I believe it's um, approaching or might have surpassed, actually, um, in the past year or two, human output levels, which fortunately have leveled off in the past you know, two years. But um, CO2 levels continue to rise despite that fact. And that is in large part because of these natural feedback loops and sources. And so this feedback loop, you know, as the, as the Arctic warms and the Earth warms, we, we release more of this methane. And to put in perspective, the methane alone has more CO2, you know, and, and, and methane locked up in it. I say CO2 when I, when I mean is CO2 equivalents locked up in it than we as a human race have output in the entire history of our industrial revolution. So as if melting this would be basically like doubling everything we've done so far, which uh, isn't just bad, it's, it's catastrophically bad. Yeah, I've also read that it's it's not a gradual process in some cases, but there's super huge pockets of methane hydrate or you know pockets of methane that once we tap into that it releases this huge bubble of methane and it's almost instantaneous yeah i mean that's so that's a theory called the calthrate gun there, there's a lot of dubious uh stuff around it a, a lot of apocalypse people like to bring it up and be like oh you know this is going to happen and we're going to see you know plus five degrees celsius overnight and there's uh there's a lot of debunking on it on on one side but there's also um you know five years ago people were saying this is not possible and there were a lot of papers coming out showing it was impossible but within the last two years i've seen a lot of papers come out that say hold up you know maybe this is actually something we need to consider and there are demonstrations that this has happened you know quite possibly geologically in the past contributing to some of the major warming events we've seen in the geological record um, and they've discovered arctic craters or craters in the arctic ocean of this this uh, methane hydrates um, exploding that they think is part of this you know clathrate explosion and um, when is, we say gun, we're speaking gun, geologically speaking. So this doesn't mean that it's, it's like overnight within a couple minutes exploding. Though some people claim that that's possible. But rather, you know, instead of being a, a conversation of eons, or even um, in this particular case, hundreds of years, but, you know, decades, which geologically speaking is lightning. If that happens, or if this methane that we already have outputting continues to output, we are in a very bad shape. And the Paris Agreement doesn't take any of this into account, even though this is one of the major feedback loops. And they identify this in their report, talking about how this is one of the largest contributors that they're gonna, we're going to see. They felt like they didn't have enough data to give accurate numbers, so they decided to just totally leave it out. And that's why two degrees Celsius is not realistic, even with all this everyone's pledges and um, magic sequestration technology that doesn't exist efficiently. And in fact, even without this modeling of the, the methane outputs, the UN and the IPCC has us at, you know, three and a half degrees Celsius. So more realistically with this addition of this methane, which if it doubles our own output of the CO2 equivalents, um, we might see five to seven degrees Celsius, even making changes and, and being conservative and, and switching to these renewables, that's the future we might see. And that's that's a future that the IPCC has called. I saw a report recently that they stopped using the word catastrophic for this because it, they felt it undersold how terrible this would be, but more, you know, apocalyptic. So talk more about what you mean by apocalyptic, because you said that this is bad and you bring up things like five degrees Celsius increase in global climate. But how exactly is that going to be felt on, to me, living in Atlanta, uh, my day to day? Uh, we keep talking in languages of Celsius. So maybe we should convert real quick to Fahrenheit for everyone to understand just how much of an impact this is. So two degrees Celsius, which is the goal that, that we're trying not to, we're trying to keep under is, is just 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's global average. So that, I mean, that doesn't sound that bad, right? But, you know, let's switch up. So 3 is 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And now we're, we were talking just a moment about, ago about 5 degrees Celsius. That's 9 degrees Fahrenheit. And let's say apocalyptic, you know, 7 degrees Celsius. That's 13 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, but David, that's just the difference between, you know, a nice day and a, and a warm day. But these are average, global averages. And some places are going to warm dramatically more than this. Some places aren't going to warm as much as this. But what it means is that there's this much more energy in the global system. 
Um, and that means more dramatic weather, the storms are going to be stronger, and our highs and our lows are going to be that much more extreme. And uh, we are very fortunate in our, our society and our civilization and culture in that we happen to be evolve and form in this very stable time and global climate. Uh, our weather is more stable than just about any other period that we can measure. It's more consistent than almost any other time that we can measure, which is something that enabled us our creation of agriculture because we have this weather that we can depend on. And as these temperatures increase and more energy gets in the system, that fact that we can depend on becomes more difficult and more erratic and more extreme. And it only takes one extreme event to wipe out a whole year's worth of consistent weather, which we just saw down in Houston with Harvey, um, out west with some of these with these fires in the east with uh, some of the monsoons and rainstorms that happen there, or even in the Middle East where we see a lot of the conflicts that's happening there that can be tied back to droughts, um, which were caused by climate change. And this isn't like a like oh you're trying to connect these dots, but these are things that the Department of Defense that uh, NASA have identified as the kindling that kicks off all this stuff. So, I mean, when we talk about these refugees in Europe, you know, people coming from Syria and from other places in the Middle East, we like to think of them as, as economic or war refugees, but really, ultimately, they're climate refugees. And this is something that, you know, we're, we're at one degree Celsius and we're already seeing this stuff. So, what does what double that? You know, well, the, the UN just came out with a report and they estimate if we continue to stay on track, one and a half to two degrees Celsius by 2050, they see these these refugees exploding in number. And it's 2050, you know, that's that's just over three decades away. And again, these reports typically underestimate things and to err on the side of conservatism because that's more politically palatable. Um, but they're estimating one billion climate refugees by that point. That's a lot. Let that sink in. Yeah, one billion. So really, we're going to be seeing not just the erratic and increased frequency of natural disasters like hurricanes, fires, but also more systemic problems like droughts, um, farmland drying up. And I feel like that's that's a real big concern because one hurricane hitting Houston, pretty bad. One hurricane hitting Miami, hitting Puerto Rico, extremely bad. But what if a lot of these things are happening at the same time? When we have a hurricane in the Gulf Coast, we have a wildfire on the West Coast, and we have drought and maybe some of our more arable lands. And, you know, people are displaced. We have no place to put them. I feel like that could be a major concern. Well, yeah. I mean, at some point, it's going to be these disasters and stuff add up, and we're just not going to be able to afford it anymore. We're already at the point, you know, because Harvey was such an expensive storm, and then we were hit by all these other storms um, and the tragedy in Puerto Rico and the stuff out west, the fire, the fires out west last I saw were close to $5 billion worth of damage alone. And that's just from forest fires. They're already wiping out most of the gains our economy has made in terms of GDP. And uh, everyone says, oh yeah, David, you know, like we're going to reinvest that money. It's going to, this $200 billion for Harvey is going to go back in there into people's jobs. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But if this, everything hadn't been destroyed, that money would be reinvested in more useful things. Money spent on rebuilding is always a poor allocation of money. And um, we'll eventually just not going to be able to afford it anymore. Insurance companies won't be able to afford it. We won't be able to, li- it'll be too expensive to live in these places and insure your, your land, your property. And we're going to have to seriously look at abandoning, you know, parts of the country, huge swaths. And some places can't be abandoned, you know. Houston gets a lot of criticism for being built uh, where they are and then paving over everything so they have flood control problems. But the fact of the matter is we need that city there. We need those people there because they have to service all this petrochemical industry that is there. And we're dependent upon that. And not just for our vehicles, but for every part of our society, for the products they create, the heavy chemicals and industry that occur there um, that support most of the rest of the country. We need those people there and we need the people to support that. So you can't just pick up and move everything. Uh, so it's a, it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of thing. And I mean, this is all something we're going to cover later and in more depth, but these, because it's hard to talk about just a single topic here because everything is so tightly interconnected and, uh, one thing leads to another thing and trying to just separate one thing and say, this is just Arctic sea ice and these are just the effects it has is too difficult. So it, it's, uh, I'm going to touch on these other stuff, but we will go into more depth about it at a later time. It sounds like a lot of these things are inevitable. And if our countries of the world can't get it together to solve some of these problems, how can we as individuals? And I mean, is it possible that just being aware of some of this stuff will make a difference in the fact that it may impact the politicians that we choose to support, the companies we choose to support? I mean, how important 
is it to be aware of some of these things that seem to be completely out of control? Well, I mean, we have like a couple of answers for that. And the first is that, practically speaking, uh, the things you do make no difference. And as glum as that sounds, it's it's true, at least on some level. Um, your impact on the system as a whole is so ridiculously tiny. Are you saying I've been wasting my time taking five minutes off my shower? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it, keep doing that. It's good. And you should, like, feel proud about yourself and your community. But, like, practically, the effects that we as individual consumers have are very, very small. Um, most of this stuff is caused by industry. Most of this stuff is caused by nations. Um, the, one of the largest polluters in the world and consumers of these, you know, petrochemicals is the U.S. military. And I mean, we tacitly support all this stuff by consuming stuff, by purchasing things, you know, by voting in politicians and stuff. And 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 those are all things we should be doing. You know, you, we should be voting. We should be recycling. You know, try not to drive. Don't buy a uh, fuel inefficient vehicle if you want to be really serious. Switch to vegetarianism. Don't ever fly. Flying is terrible. If you fly once, you know, you wipe out basically every other good thing you do. I say that as somebody who flies. You know, but practically speaking, even if everybody made these changes, we're still, like, very fucked. Because uh, our standard of living, the electricity we require, even with efficient things, and just the making stuff is very expensive in terms of this CO2, in terms of these greenhouse gases. Our way of life, our standard of living is very resource intensive. And... The only solution um, in terms of this is to just accept a lower standard of living, and that's not an option for a lot of people. And when I say lower standard of living, I don't mean like, oh, yeah, it means take your bike. I mean like you live in a small place, you have less. And and I see a lot of people starting to turn to this, and there's there's a lot of people, they've, they've dubbed this simple living. And I see a lot of millennials, you know, pursuing um, minimalism, having less stuff, focusing more on, on experiences rather than things. Those are all steps in the right direction, but we need to be more content with less and to be less comfortable. And if we can, we can do that as a society, we can do that globally, uh, then we might have a chance. But I mean, that's, that's uh, a lot to ask from people. It's a lot to ask from people in, in third worlds who are less fortunate, who look up to the standard of living that we take for granted in places like the United States and aspire to that. And for us to say, like, no, you can't have that and we can't have that either because, you know, we're destroying the world. Is that fair? I don't, I don't know. But those are the realities we might have to face soon. Yeah, that's really well put. I'm definitely going to try. And, you know, I think the next week going forward, I'm going to think about that a lot as what can I do less? And hopefully that will make me a little bit less depressed about some of this stuff that we've been talking about. I mean, it doesn't have to be depressing, except this stuff that you, that it's not going to make a difference. Like, uh, it doesn't matter who you vote in, though you should go vote for people that you think are going to help you because it's out of their hands. And the choices that they have as politicians in order to fix this is politically so unpalatable it'll never happen because the, the answer is shrink the economy. Yeah. Which is never, never, ever going to, what, what, what politician is going to get elected? Like, if you vote for me, I'll make sure there are less jobs. Like, that's, that's never going to happen. Yeah. But I mean, that's, I'm not saying don't be politically involved. I'm not saying like, say, you know, I'm going to throw my trash out and, and leave my shower on all day. Don't get me wrong. Uh, these things do matter and they do add up, but they're not going to change the course of the world. But what you can do, you know, that doesn't mean to say, fuck, fuck the world, fuck my community, because you're still part of your community. You're still building this community. And that's something I, I really want to focus on in this show. And this is something Daniel and I talk about all the time. And is that, you know, we're facing this global catastrophe, something that's out of our hands. And that's something like as these feedback loops continue are going to be out of humanity's hands. There's nothing we can do, even if we like, even if we we're able to snap our fingers and, you know, magically switch everything to fully renewable energies or clean energies or like we invented fusion power. Aliens came down and gave us this free limitless energy. We still face these these horrible problems these economic problems and, the, and these realities that we need to face. Things are outside of our control, but what we can do is affect our community around us and make the place you know, a better for everyone else immediately within our lives. Yeah, I think that's really important, especially considering some of these things that we have caused in the world is driven by our desire to consume both resources and the products that we can create from those resources. And so kind of realizing that that's been a problem and you know there is a community around us there are people around us that we can take part in and, and find more meaningful ways to interact with the world i think is a healthier 
perspective and a healthier way to go about living. Yeah, and trying to fill some of these these holes in ourselves that we filled with stuff for so long after years of conditioning as, as individual consumers and replacing that back with, you know, the people around us, these experiences within our communities and, um, you know, helping and getting back into, you know, living with people, which is the most human thing we can do. I say as I sit in my apartment by myself with my cat. I was actually just my about two to bedroom say. apartment by my <laughs> And the and the more I think about it, the more of a challenge it seems or at least such a foreign concept. I know personally as an introvert, you know, I live in a big apartment building. I don't know hardly any of my neighbors. There's a few that I see, you know, because we happen to cross paths along the same time, but it's such it's so strange that it's a foreign concept or a a strange concept to get to know the people around you and to participate but it, it's really been ingrained out of us in a lot of ways. And I mean, maybe if, if that was the case and that we were more responsible with our neighbors and stuff, uh, we wouldn't have gotten ourselves into this mess at, in the first place. And I, this whole show, everything sounds so negative. And I mean, it is. This is, uh, I, I, I tend, to, when I have this conversation with people, I tend to liken it to a doctor coming up and telling somebody that they're going to die in six months <laughs> and there's nothing they could do. Um, and we can maybe, you know, fight and struggle and, and we can make it a miserable eight months so that they can like live a couple, a little bit longer, but they're doomed anyway. The, the prognosis is bad, but that doesn't mean we, we can't enjoy this time and, and do the things we've always wanted to and, um, you know, work to make the world a better place in the time that we have left. And again, that sounds super negative and, and bad. And, and the timeline for all this happening is very up in the air. I for sure see it happening within my lifetime, things getting very bad. But other people, you know, every single year, somebody's calling for the apocalypse. They say, this is the year, you know, 2015, this is when it's going to end. And, and here we are a couple years later. Um, and, and every year, those are the predictions feel a little more accurate and they feel like it's like, well, you know what? Maybe they're right this time. Maybe 2018 is the one, maybe 2020, but that doesn't really matter. The timeline doesn't matter. All you can do, like we've talked about, is focus on your life and positively impacting the lives of the people around you. Look, we're going to have a, an opportunity to talk about a lot more things in the future and talk about how bad everything is. <laughs> so let's end on a, on a good note. Um, well, uh, we're also going to talk about it quite in depth, the good things we can do and, and talk about community a lot. Those, that's a focus, again, of both of us. Um, so, I, I mean, this isn't always going to be ending on like a you're going to die note, <laughs> but you will. We're also going to be talking a lot about the good things we can do to improve our lives, to be a part of our community. And, and maybe we should end it on that and uh, look forward to next week. Yeah, everyone, you should go meet your neighbor. Go, go say hey to your neighbor if you don't know them. Introduce yourself. That's your homework. Yeah. Go do it. Homework. You never you, you came in thinking you were going to have fun, but now you, you just know you're going to die and you have to go do homework. Double one-two punch for you. <laughs> yeah, I bet, bet you all can't wait all right. for the next one. All right, see you guys next time. Thanks for tuning in. This was Ashes Ashes. Bye.